Analyst Jolene Stein Kotzia from the Human Science Research Council, and she joins us from the Port Elizabeth Studios. A very good morning to you, ladies. Thank you so much for joining us, and welcome. Good morning. Okay, I'm going to start with you, uh, Professor. Do you think that uh, Athol Trollip will survive this motion of no confidence? No, all the indications are that he will. And that is if the micro parties, if those one councillor parties, actually, and especially the African Independent Congress and the Patriotic Alliance, if they vote the way they indicated in the last two days that they would, and indicated that they will be switching sides from the DA to the ANC and giving a range of reasons for that. And it showed how local government and these very fragile changeable alliances at local gov government level have really become a punching bag for bigger political issues, issues of race, issues of land, issues of just changing power, issues, issues to give opportunities for political speeches like we've just seen um, Fikil Mbalila for ANC's right. elections team deliver there. And so he will probably survive and that is possibly why we are seeing the fracas in the council at the moment with a possibility even that that council right. session may be adjourned right right now uh, Jolene let me just bring you into this conversation is the motion about service delivery or is it merely uh, about political parties flexing their muscles That's a very interesting question. I think if we kind of follow some of the narrative and some of the, the uh, developments that have happened quite recently around this motion of no confidence, one almost gets the sense that it is indeed a platform for smaller political parties to flex their political muscle to say to both the ANC and the DA that in effect even though you are the bigger parties, you do need us. We know the patriotic alliance that come forward after sensitive negotiations um, and securing some uh, let's say advantage uh, and similarly the African Independent Congress had also announced that they would support the DAN Council because they feel that the ANC is not taking the Matatiele issue quite as seriously as they should. Now can or does a coalition government provide uh, the requisite uh, service delivery at the local government level? With the issue around service delivery, it's also a very interesting narrative. We have seen quite a contested um, a vision of whether they, the DA had indeed delivered on its mandate or whether it had not delivered on its mandate. I think what we see with the, particularly this motion of no confidence um, would also be a sense that political parties might feel that they are not sufficiently included in what should be a coalition government. We know that the relationship between the DA and the UDM had broken down quite early. Uh, we know that the EFF, for example, had very specific policy directives that they had wanted to pursue within the Nelson Mandela Bay and that there is a sense that this is not necessarily happening because the, the uh, coalition might be too DA dominated as has been constructed. Um, so I think what we see here is the narrative of service delivery coming forward as almost a justification to say look listen we need to remove this mayor things are not moving forward quite as fast as we want them to indeed indeed now professor poison how do two parties with exceptionally divergent policy views come together integrate those policy views uh, without actually compromising the institutional integrity of both parties and thereby uh, affecting the core mandate which is service to the people Yes, uh, that is one of the points of extreme fragility, fragility in, in these alliances. We've seen the DA and EFF cooperating, I presume you were referring largely to that. And they have stressed here, and it's an ongoing phenomenon, stress that they are in this cooperative agreement, they uh, prefer not to call it an alliance, and say, yes, they're putting parties in power, but they are not co-governing. And so so, and we see a continuation then uh, into the current situation where the ANC has said, yes, they might be going with the EFF, but they are not, they don't want to govern at this point. Mm -hmm. And the EFF really not going into government either and handing prepared uh, uh, up to a few days ago to hand power 
to these single member or two member very very small parties and those parties cannot govern on their own they need one of the bigger parties so it's parties that big parties none of them really being ready to govern the DA is putting an effort in place there but it is a long process to turn around to actually show delivery show that they can make a difference to delivery and meantime the other parties are lining up not really wanting to govern but want to destabilize an ANC uh, at the alliance with the DA leading there. And we see that across several, multiple sure. municipalities around the country. Sure. There are many of them with these very fragile minorities and majorities. One, two people. We've seen Beaufort West changes. We've seen Russenberg changes. Mm. And th that is also happening, but in a major metro here where the power balance is just too fragile. Mm. We've seen a small parties AIC and PA changing in the last few days but they could with a drop of a hat just switch in the other direction again so it's very unstable government and the advent uh, professor the advent of a, a coalition government is squarely premised on the belief that uh, my, the enemy of my enemy is my friend and thereby one party benefits from that uh, marriage of convenience, as it were. So, would I be correct to say that the other party in that unit, in that union, or that union, yeah, union, is merely playing a subjective role? Is that, is that a fair point? Yes, these these games are there all the time. Realignments are there all the time. But then we know the AIC, they are that small regional Eastern Cape party, were largely around, formed around the issue of Matatel. They are in the mountains of the Eastern Cape so far, where they should remain in Eastern Cape or go to KwaZulu Natal. And the AIC has that many promises. They also are helping to keep the ANC in power in Ikurileni municipality in Gauteng. In recent days, they have expressed their unhappiness, anger that the ANC people in Eastern Cape have also said that transfer of Matetel to KwaZulu Natal, which a AIC wants, will not happen. And so now they're punishing the a ANC at this metropolitan level to do that. And we have seen that the Patriotic Alliance, they come in now on a big, they have switched sides so many times, more often than not being aligned to the a ANC. But now saying on the issue of racism and racism that they detect in Julius Malema's statements as to why the DA should be removed. They said that's anathema to them and that obviously is not what their constituency, especially in the northern areas of Nelson Mandela Bay municipality want. So they're playing big politics there but and there are so many flaws mm -hmm. in the major parties and their repertoires that the smaller parties will always find some reason to change their sides. Yeah. Now, Jolene, you've just heard Professor Boysen just touched on the issue of racism or rather the perceived racism on the part of Julius Malema. I want to engage you on that in just a moment. But then, should Trollip survive this motion of no confidence against him? Will the other political parties make his life difficult going forward? That, of course, is the difficulty or the, 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 the danger um, is that we could potentially find a situation where the power divide uh, within the council could create a situation where policy and service delivery can actually not continue. So you could effectively sit with a hung council where decisions cannot be affected, um, various directives, uh, IDPs and so forth cannot be um, accepted because you find council becomes a, a, a theater for politics or political theatre, if you will, where either smaller parties or different opposition parties are using this to try and gain more benefit for issues that does not necessarily apply at a local council level. And in effect, we have seen this in Nelson Mandela Bay before, most notably um, in the build-up to the 2011 local government elections, where the ANC was so, so, so factionalised that service delivery did come to a standstill. Racism or racial profiling is uh, perhaps the, uh, uh, the proverbial elephant in the room. Julius Malema at some point was quoted as having said that uh, he wants to slit the throat of a white man. And he's also been uh, quoted as having made inflammatory and uh, highly racial statements. So is racism playing a huge role here? Uh, I mean, uh, just the other day or yesterday, should uh, to be more specific, he said that, uh, no, I don't hate white people. Just that, uh, and use this analogy that uh, if I live my wife it does not necessarily mean that I hate the other person do you do you buy that you know I think 
what we are seeing here in terms of this racism or, 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 or uh, let's say racial rhetoric that seems to underlie this motion of no confidence is almost the convenience of racial electioneering. Um, and the EFF is not the only party to engage in that type of electioneering when they bring, um, uh, whether it's a motion of no confidence or policy, um, uh, sorry, political speeches, uh, electioneering speeches, campaigning and mobilization. We have seen various other parties also engage almost in a convenience of race um, electioneering to try and mobilize support behind their particular political agenda. And I think that is something that has been part of the South African electoral system for quite a number of years. You know, you can trace it back to political parties including the ANC, the EFF, um, we have heard the DA, for example, in their 1999 campaign as well, um, you know, coming forward and saying that we need to be careful because the, the whatever policy agendas the other parties will follow is not necessarily inclusive of everybody. And for me, that is where we do need to start paying attention to how responsible political parties are when they engage in their electioneering and justification for whatever their political agendas are. All right, now, Professor, uh, what do you make of the uh, EFF's bullying tactics and uh, for what they call punishing the Democratic Alliance for not supporting them uh, in their quest for the acquisition of, of, of land without compensation? How did it get to this point? Yes, you know, one can really understand at national level that there is an engagement, anger, and the l land is the, uh, so important for the EFF, and they say that, and they want to make that point. And EFF very soon, uh, in the next year, or in about a year's time at the latest, would have to go to the electorate and explain in many places how could we have been in alliance or cooperative arrangement at so many municipal level, at municipal level, many municipalities with the DA. So therefore the EF, if this is crucial electioneering time, they have to show that they are true to their platform, their constituency, and that they are not subject to the DA. And so that is an important national issue. But then the parties are struggling to differentiate the national from the local. Local where service delivery has to continue, where municipalities cannot be continuously disrupted by the bigger power play. And so they are municipalities are suffering the transfer of polit politics politicized issues into the local government but they should the political parties if they want to comp uh, campaign they want to but in the first place want to be in alliances governing alliances together they have to find a way to make those alliances work at local level without being without feeling they are ideologically tainted at a national level but that is a bridge that only the political parties can cross. And we know both parties and uh, their ideologies and what they represent. So this antagonistic approach towards each other, is it uh, underpinned by race, you believe? There are there are many racial issues there, in America and and they are the both these are two parties the DA and the EFF are the two in South Africa that are probably most racially profiled and they're the most racially defined electoral support base. The DA of course has been changing in recent years and they have more black members and white members etc. All of those statistics, but they have not been able to shed that image of being the party rep and truly so, being the party that represents represents white privilege and they have to defend those issues while they simultaneously expand in exact same constituency that is the EFF's constituency and so it is that contest there and the EFF now tries to differentiate itself from the DA with a view to next year's election but in the process the local governments are suffering. And I want to engage you on uh, whether uh, coalition politics uh, do have a future in South Africa in just a moment. And uh, I want to bring you in, Jolene, in this. Where does this live, uh, the future of alliance politics in South Africa, especially the EFF and the DA coalitions in uh, Nelson Mandela Bay Metro and in, 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 in Gauteng, in Swane, and the city of Joburg? Yeah, I think what we, what we are seeing here, as we have both pointed out, is that you have this power play almost happening where political parties are flexing um, 
their political muscles. I think looking at how some of these coalitions came about, um, obviously it was born out of the result of the 2016 local government elections, highly contested, neither the ANC nor the DA were able to get outright majorities and therefore needed to rely on building partnerships. And many of these partnerships, one almost gets a sense, was built on the idea that we have to get the ANC out of governance. Um, and with that very short-term vision, I don't necessarily think some of the longer-term uh, political agendas and, and service delivery priorities and strategies were necessarily sufficiently negotiated. So I do think moving forward, looking at coalition politics, if that is a possibility for um, a national sort of landscape that your opposition parties will really need to come together and negotiate those finer details and more long-term planning around what it is that they want to achieve with their partnership or their coalition um, and it cannot merely be limited to we need to get the ANC out of power. All right, now, Professor, what's your views regarding uh, the future of alliance politics in South Africa? Well, that could be the future, but it's a very <laughs> fragile and stable future. I was just thinking what is happening in Nelson Mandela Bay today could happen at the drop of the hat in Johannesburg, in Swane, in Ekurulene, if the AIC withdraws from its alliance with the A ANC in Ekurulene, there are problems. EFF is an in-between party, not nearly as big as the ANC and DA in these metros, but bigger than the micro parties, and they are the kingmakers in any of these municipalities. So if they really, really want to, in the run-up to next year's elections, we assume it's next year and not early elections, um, want to differentiate themselves from the DA, they could let those municipalities tumble and erupt into this kind of chaos that we see in Nelson Mandela Bay anytime. And why isn't the ANC uh, joining in the fray and why haven't they fielded a candidate? Well, we just heard uh, Figuila Mbalula earlier on saying that, hey, we are not a position grabbers here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're not the bosses. Are they, is the ANC literally handing power over to the EFF? Just the other day, uh, you heard Julius Malema yeah. saying that uh, we call the shots here. We are in charge. The ANC is absolutely battling with that at the moment. They are starting to realize that they have got this image of being a lucky, a big colossus, Mono the left lucky to the EFF, and that is the image in many, many minds. But the ANC, I think in just the last two weeks, has started regaining a bit of ground of the EFF. And the ANC would have to differentiate themselves and make sure they are not seen as the lucky to the EFF, not EFF being an engine and the ANC following. The ANC really needs that. And we see it a little bit in terms of ANC being a bit more assertive in articulating own, its own directions and emerging directions on land policy and stating that they are not <laughs> in the shadow of the EFF. Mm. But the ANC would have to be very careful there. Obviously in Elsa Mandela Bay, we all know the Crispin Olver's book, How to Steal a City, that huge corruption, procurement problems in under the ANC in Nelson Mandela Bay. Those problems have not even been corrected yet. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think the ANC would at this stage do much better for itself if it regains and rebuilds its own credibility and prove to voters that it is this new dawn Ramaphoria driven party and not just something a party who wants to regain and grab in effect power even if indirectly yeah. in due course uh, without uh, things having been fixed there so rather rebuilt in party political base and then gradually move into the public space again yeah yeah now Jolene here we are talking about a metro which has been named <coughs> after uh, an ANC icon which has also been handed over to the opposition in, uh, in 2016. So what sort of influence would this move have on the political dynamics within the Nelson Mandela metro? Sorry, I couldn't catch that last bit. What was the, the what, what would yeah, the implication what sort of, be for what political dynamics? Okay, what sort of influence will this move have on the political dynamics within the Nelson Mandela Bay Metro? 
look, I've always um, felt that if you look at the name Nelson Mandela Bay, bearing in mind it is in the Eastern Cape, um, and we know that the Eastern Cape is seen as the proverbial heartland of the ANC. So, in effect, the loss of Nelson Mandela Bay for, um, for the ANC carried quite a lot of symbolism. It really almost cemented a notion that the level of delegitimation of ANC governance has reached such a level that it cannot regain or retain political trust within its own heartland, within its, its the biggest municipality within its heartland. And we have also seen um, a decline of support, for electoral support for the ANC systematically through every election in the Eastern Cape. So I think the symbolism around this, um, what we see in terms of this power play, it's quite ironic if one considers that Nelson Mandela was one looking for cooperation, for reconciliation, who really almost advanced that notion of rainbowism, of coming together, of rebuilding, right? Reconciliation and forgiveness. Um, and to a large degree, we don't see any issue of negotiation, compromise, or a sense of rebuilding, so to speak, playing out within the broader coalition politics. And for me, that is quite an ironic, an ironic dynamic. All right, now, uh, Professor Poison, uh, I'm going to have to let you go. Unfortunately, well, I wish we could have the whole day with you <laughs> discussing this. But then before I let you go, as the tectonic plates in the Nelson Mandela Bay Metro mm. are shifting, what's likely to happen moving forward? I, you know, we can see even if today Trollope survives, we've also seen Jealous Malema pledging that the end that Trollope will not see the end of his term. So the, uh, these dynamics are not going to go away. And the small parties, these one-person parties, are going, one councillor parties, are going to keep remain in the pound seats that instability is going to remain there and we uh, this is going to be up to the bigger parties to try to build more enduring alliances with the small parties and when come the time of local government by-elections there are going to be huge fights to to regain to gain a seat here and there we know one of the ANC councillors Nombiba has been convicted already of fraud, money laundering, etc., in terms of municipal funds, and he will be sentenced, I think, on the 26th of April. And it's if he has doesn't get the option of a fine, etc., then he will be a council lost, and there could be another by-election. So, in the meantime, it's ultra mobilisation. We assume the political parties there in the council chambers in the Bay have managed to get all, each and every one of their councillors is ill or not yeah, in the chamber right. today but it's going to be municipal governments on the edge that can tumble by a power change in any direction any time and even come next year's national and provincial elections where there could be overall changes so the ANC could possibly regain more power at the local level it is throughout the term that we're going to have this instability and that is the political future we see at national level one can relate to that the fact that knows that uh, Cyril Ramaphosa has won uh, the internal battle and has regained some credibility for the ANC can probably avoid, help avoid that a national dynamics could be a future version yeah. of what we have in Nelson Mandela Bay. Yeah, Professor, as we see on your screens right now, things are getting really, really heated up uh, at the oh. chambers. And I'm going to ask you to stay one more minute as uh, our viewers <laughs> have already spoken and they've tweeted. Let's take a look at some of those tweets that have been coming through from our viewers uh, at this hour. All right, we'll start with the poll. Do you think that Nelson Mandela Bay Metro Mayor Athol Trollip will survive today's motion of no confidence? Well, 49% uh, believe so and 51% say no. All right. Um, okay, let's take a look at some of the tweets. Zami says he will survive because the EFF doesn't have much support on this one. And how do you expect uh, uh, to be supported when you remove someone from power just because of his color, not because of his work or corruption or even more wrongdoings? The Black Swan says, I doubt he will survive it. Nazim Khutbum says, buying votes won't make him survive the motion. Athol Trollip must go, finishing club. All right.
those are just some of the views uh, from our viewers. And uh, Professor, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the last tweet uh, about the vote buying. Do you think it's what exactly uh, happened, uh, bringing the, the, the PA and the AIC into the fray? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, of course it, it is possible. You know, these uh, the small uh, councillor, one councillor parties, they've been switching all the way, this way, that way. And we know the Patriotic Alliance now is in a pound seat. They claim that the ANC is offered there the, the mayoral position. Apparently the DA is prepared to let motions go, to let the position of deputy mayor be reinstated. In, in the city so that it can be made available to the Patriotic Alliance. That is, even if money doesn't change hands, positions are up for grabs mm. here. Mm. And you can imagine the, you know, the heightened profile that for in running up to next year's elections that the Patriotic Alliance will have should they be in a position of mayor or deputy mayor sure. in a major metro. So... Yes, that it's that kind of influence to make sure the small parties align with one of the bigger ones. It can never be ruled out that money might be changing hands in some form or another, or at least some benefits are being promised and delivered. Sure. Professor Susan Poison from the Vets School of Governance, we thank you for your time. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right, uh, let's now go back to uh, Port Elizabeth and uh, Professor Jolene Steinkotzia from the Human Science Research Council uh, is there. Now, uh, let's talk about the last tweet from our viewer who is essentially saying that avoid, vote buying was actually uh, in the fray here, uh, bringing in the Patriotic Alliance and the AIC. Do you think that it is actually the case? Well, Professor Susan Poison would like to believe so. You know, I think what we have seen, uh, we know that there was some sort of, of very sensitive negotiations. We know that the Patriotic Alliance came um, out, I think it was on Tuesday evening to say, or on Tuesday to say that they will uh, definitely make an announcement as to who they will side with. They are in discussions with all political parties. It is at a sensitive point um, in, 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 in the negotiation. And then, of course, they came forward and said that they will be uh, siding with the Democratic alliance on this particular one but I think the broader context or, or, or historical context would matter here because we know that there was unhappiness between the DA and the UDM we know that the PA had supported the DA um, most notably around the removal of the deputy mayor uh, of the, UD, uh, the UDM deputy mayor um, and I think there was also some unhappiness because the PA had felt that they should have been given some sort of, of reward, um, you know, or some sort of, of leniency, so to speak, or, or, or a benefit for supporting the DA in dealing with some of the controversies around uh, UDM former Deputy Mayor Bobani. So I think what we have seen here is the PA really capitalizing on the opportunity that had opened up here with the motion of no confidence, knowing very well that they are actually in a powerful position given that the, the DA would need them as well as the other smaller councillors to side with them in order to survive this vote of no confidence. So, you know, whether one can classify that as vote buying, um, I'm not entirely sure. I would say, however, that what we do see here is the normal let's say back and forth of political chess um, as parties try to uh, uh, emerge victorious from you know these types of motions of no confidence and and so forth so has the trust between the da and the eff uh, been broken down are we likely to uh, seeing as a precedent's been set here um, moving on to the other provinces where the coalition is actually in effect You know, it's an interesting question because that kind of works on the premise that there was a form of, of, of trust between the DA and the EFF, um, you know, prior to moving into, into these uh, coalitions. We know that the EFF did not go into a coalition government with any political party, um, and rather they, they, they stood back and said that they will support, um, you know, as far as possible. So I think what we see here is the EFF really demonstrating 
that as Julius Malema had said, we are in charge, we hold the cards. So if the ANC would like to move forward with something, for example, um, they cannot do so without the support of the EFF and the same goes for the Democratic Alliance. So I think he, what we see here is that power play political dynamic um, and the danger of course is the EFF can be seen as a destabilizer of governance um, in bringing sufficient service delivery and continuity to service delivery at a municipal level. So I think it's a very delicate line, it's a very delicate game that the EFF is playing right now. Some other smaller political parties are watching as this drama unfold. Uh, they are actually watching from the sidelines. Do you think uh, they will be in a position to maybe join the DA or they will refrain from doing so as a result of uh, feeling that uh, you know, joining the DA may be compromising some dearly held principles? Does it really? Um, again, that is something that will have to play out, you know, as time that we will see as we move closer and closer to either a national election or as local government elections roll around again. Um, one may find that uh, smaller political parties, you know, you have one councillor, for example, may decide, you know what, it's better to maybe side with either the DA or the ANC for that matter, whichever political party, not necessarily on the basis of political principles, but rather expediency and trying to get some sort of um, delivery or delivery on their promises to their particular constituency by using the vehicle of bigger parties. Um, you know, coalitions and, and, and parties merging with other parties are not necessarily built on ideologies and princi uh, principles only. There are other realities that also come into play, most notably around trying to secure delivering um, on the promises or alternatively trying to secure the most benefit through trying to join these bigger political parties. You've also mentioned uh, a political chairs. Who is the political master here? Oh, interesting question, um, you know, because for all intents and purposes, if one looks at the dynamics within Nelson Mandela Bay in particular, it would seem that the EFF right now is the puppet master through this vote of no confidence. Um, you know, the EFF had essentially gotten the DA to, to scramble a little bit, I would argue, um, most notably around, you know, going back to the PA to negotiate. Um, of course, it played in, in the DA's favor that the ANC had made the statement for the to say that Matatiele will remain in the Eastern Cape and not join KwaZulu Natal. So the AIC is coming forward and saying they are not happy and they will flex their muscle by siding with the um, with the DA. So and I think that is a very very strong message for both the ANC and the Democratic Alliance. They may be the bigger political parties, but if they do not secure their outright majorities, they will not be able to move forward without the smaller parties and I think that message is coming through very very strongly from the EFF. Now does this sort of uh, provide a window into uh, what's likely to happen come 2019? You know, I think um, if you look towards the 2019 general election, we also have to bear in mind that there is new leadership for the ANC. Um, a lot of the dynamics, I think, for the 2016 local government elections was around a delegitimation of ANC governance. We had issues of factionalism, there was issues of corruption. Um, of course, you know, we, we cannot ignore the, the cloud of allegations that had surrounded the then ANC leader, um, and President, former President Jacob Zuma. So a lot of those issues could have played in where many ANC voters had decided to rather stay away from the polls as opposed to go and vote. If we interrogate some of the electoral results, most notably in Nelson Mandela Bay, yes, the Democratic Alliance had increased their support um, base within ANC strongholds, but not sufficient enough for them to actually gain an outright majority, whereas the ANC numbers seem to have stabilized. And similar dynamic in the northern areas, both the ANC and the DA had uh, retained very similar results than what they had retained in 2011, showing that they didn't really make any further inroads, so to speak, within the northern areas community. Um, so I think 
When we look at the 2019 general election, it is all going to depend. It's the narrative of land, uh, without uh, land appropriation, without compensation. It is going to be to what extent is Cyril Ramaphosa able to, one, unite the ANC, and two, engage um, the electorate to such an extent that they might be willing to give the ANC another chance. Well, pessimists have been saying that uh, the ANC is over. I mean, the ANC is finished come 2019. On the other hand, optimists are saying that, hell, hang on a second, with the so-called Ramaphoria having taken effect, the ANC will be back with a bang. So where do you fit uh, in, this, in, in this kind of equation? Well, for me, I think... Uh Mo one of the likely scenarios that could play out in the 2019 general electoral result is more of a balance of power. Um, you know, where we no we won't necessarily see an ANC as dominant as what we have seen with each and every single general election over the course of our democratic history. Um, I think that we will in most likely see the ANC lose some of its electoral muscle or its electoral capital, um, and which could potentially create more of a balance of power within Parliament, which is actually what you want. Um, you know where those controversial policy positions um, or those controversial decisions cannot necessarily pass purely because a political party has an overwhelming um, majority within the institution, but rather that you want it open to debate and that there should be some level of cooperation. Of course, the danger, and that is where, where uh, the scary political future, as my colleague Professor Boysen had, had noted, lies, is if we look at the fracas and, and some of the instabilities within Nelson Mandela Bay, and one appreciates the fact that there's a likelihood it can spread to other municipalities as well, the political instability could then result in a national political future too. The land issue, the uh, land debate, I'm actually glad you touched on it. Uh, where does it leave the, uh, the Democratic Alliance, especially in the opposition benches? You know, for the, we know that the Democratic Alliance has come forward and they have said um, that they are not... They are not in favor of any land appropriation without compensation, um, that we should operate within the confines of the Constitution and so forth. Um, I do think, however, that you know, given the highly politicized nature of the narrative on land, and we know that the EFF has pushed forward to say that people must go occupy land, take land, um, they will support the ANC through, through this, um, obviously builds on mobilizing some level of support with with a view to the future elections. The difficulty for the Democratic Alliance, of course, is how are they going to fit in that highly politicized debate without necessarily compromising on their commitment to the principles of private property. Um, one of the things that they have mentioned is that one needs to look at how the land redistribution process has unfolded and what some of the potholes are. So, of course, um, that would mean that your uh, current ANC government would really need to start a commission or some sort of investigation to see what are the obstacles to land redistribution this long into our democracy um, and potentially that could then open up a whole other can of worms most notably around of course as we've seen the rise of the tenderpreneur so to speak of uh, political elites using these types of processes to secure some sort of benefit for themselves. All right. Jolene, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Well, those are our guests, uh, political analyst uh, from the Vets uh, School of Governance, Professor Susan Boysen, a little earlier, and political analyst Jolene Steinkotz here from the Human Science Research Council talking to us about uh, the vote of no confidence against Nelson Mandela Bay Metro Mayor Athol Trollip. And I will certainly be crossing over there once the uh, session has already started. We do understand that uh, it's been uh, adjourned already, and our reporters, uh, Ivi Oporti and uh, Unati, is actually uh, on the line. And, uh, well, actually... Um, Musi Maimani will be on the line. We'll, chatting, we'll be chatting to him in just a moment, immediately after the weather. But for now, here's Azri with your weather.